technologies that have helped people to read over the last 200 plus years. Uh, but a lot of these artifacts don't have their personal stories attached to them. Uh, so Heather and I wanted to sort of bring in some people to talk about you know, how they use technology or how their reading habits have changed over the years, and then hopefully open it up to the discussion afterwards about um, say the differences between reading with your eyes, reading with your ears, reading with your fingers, however you do it. Before I introduce our speakers, though, um, there was one member of the panel who couldn't join us today, and that's John Hall. Um, some of you will have read his work. So John is a professor emeritus at the University of Birmingham, and he's written a couple of fantastic memoirs on blindness, uh, which is how I first got to know his work. Um, these include Touching the Rock, an Experience of Blindness, that he wrote in 1990, and On Sight and Insight, A Journey into the World of Blindness. So, uh, fantastic first-hand accounts of what it was like for him to lose his sight he did send us a statement, though, that we put up on the website in its full version. I just wanted to read a couple of lines then to introduce this panel. John Hall says, Modern technology has saved my intellectual life and restored access to the libraries of the world. I still sometimes mourn for the touch and smell of the printed book, which I think will never die. But blind people will in the future look increasingly to technology to, na to enable them to read. I am waiting for a flat sheet which I can lay down on a page of a printed book and have it read to me. So clearly the technology has had a huge impact on him and clearly uh, he's gone from uh, reading with his eyes entirely to reading in lots of different ways. Uh, which brings me to our three speakers that we've invited here. So to sort of get a sense of the different ways that people read, uh, I invited three of the most interesting people. Um, so I will introduce them in turn, um, right before they speak. And they'll each say maybe a few words, five to ten minutes, talking about some aspect of reading, whether it's how the reading habits have changed, or differences they notice between different media, um, or their experience with particular reading devices. We're going to start with Sejal Sitara, who is a research associate in English at the University of Exeter. She's currently writing a book titled Multipolar Modernity, Modernity and the Making of Modernist Resistance. And she's also working on the volume, or maybe finished by now, about indigenous activist writing in India. Just oh, just started, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, started. so I'll have to wait a bit for that. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks to Matt and Heather for organizing. This is such a great honor to be here. Um, I'm really excited to talk to other people um, who read in multiple and sundry ways. And I think the quickest thing that uh, comes to mind for me always is to remember just how very diverse experiences are. So even for any blind person that reads, there's nothing to say that people read in the same way. And I'm sure that hearing from people today will just enforce that. Another quote that Matt read from John Hall's piece, I, I can't, I couldn't say it more clearly than that. I think it's very much true that technology, at least for me, has saved my, my intellectual life and actually is in the process of saving it even more powerfully than it has in years past. So to share a little bit about myself, I would say that um, I come at this question of reading that converge. One is just that I happen to be someone who loved to read, who loved to be told stories as a child, and um, enjoyed it because it was a form of pleasure and escape and exposure and knowledge. Uh, the second is that I, uh, for better or worse, decided to become an academic and that in literature in a discipline that requires a tremendous amount of reading. Um, and third, as somebody who was born sighted, lost a good chunk of vision, had a little bit of it saved, and then lost a little bit that was saved. So um, going from someone who was reading print books, albeit somewhat painstakingly, that, uh, that were regular sized print, to audio recordings to using now the more sophisticated um, scanning and computer-based technologies that allowed speech to text sorts of work. And there were, I guess maybe the best way to do this would be to say what I learned about myself and about the 
challenges that I would want to spend the rest of my life, I guess, finding uh, ways to address or resolve. And in some cases I have, um, and in many cases I think it's an ongoing journey. So when I was reading small print, well, I would call it small print now, but it's not small print, it's standard print. Um, and, you know, reading Nancy Drew books as a seven-year-old, I definitely was able to read them, but I had a very limited field of vision. So about a keeping size. So what this meant was, in my experience, I could still see and that I was going out and riding my bicycle and roller skating. And, and I'm not suggesting that if you're completely blind, you can't do this. I'm just saying that I had the vision that I used to do it that way. But so, so whenever it came time to say, be in a class where the teacher had us doing a round robin and we had to read paragraph at a time, by the time I would say about 11 and starting to lose vision so very gradually, I found this a really nerve-wracking process because reading with this narrow field of vision was a really time-consuming thing. Um, by about 12 or 13, I had graduated to larger print books, so things that were enlarged, in a, using an enlarging uh, facility on a copy machine, a standard photocopy. Um, and it wasn't, I, I did not use the CCTV because I couldn't actually use one, but I know that it's something people use. And then by the time I was 15, um, so in the States, this would be a, a sophomore in high school, I really had lost the ability to read visually with my eyes in any way, and also to write, which is to say I could write things, but I couldn't see them. So I remember there came a point in the middle of the school year where I had gone from writing my algebra problems out to having to have someone else write them out for me. So this was the trajectory of the, the vision laws. Um, and then I'll introduce you to another trajectory and then pass it on to Selena. So the three things that emerged very quickly were that one, I needed to find a way that I could read fast enough to keep up with my work and um, attend university. Um, and I, I knew that that was something I wanted to do but I, of course, panicked when I realized, oh gosh, what am I going to do? And so I had a teacher that worked with me very closely and really trained me how to listen. Because when you take in information visually, and I would still describe myself as a visual learner, even though people that study theories of teaching, so pedagogy, are now starting to question whether there, there really is an inherent learning style or whether it's just a preference. Right? But she really worked with me on how to listen, how to pick up information, how to organize ideas, and I, I'm absolutely in her debt. I don't think I could articulate how she did it. I just know that she did, and it was invaluable. Um, and then uh, the other things that happened were, and this is just to give you a look at how, how much things have changed in a relatively short period of time. In 1995, in my college years, it, I was reading every single book that I needed to read by having someone tape record it for me. Because even though I learned Braille at 16 and I could write in Braille, I could not read it fast enough to keep up with things. Um, when I got to graduate school, I realized that there was so much reading that I found that I was not able to cover the breadth and depth of research that my peers were to write the kind of quality papers that they were writing. And it was an incredibly difficult and stressful experience. But I want to clarify that this is particular to my situation. So there may be other people who, say, learned Braille from birth and had more access to things than I did and were better equipped um, to, to handle the reasons than I was. Um, but by 2004, I could get scanned books from the university, although I got a book every two weeks, maybe I got one. Um, last spring, I was working on a conference paper. Um, I was able to download six academic two to three hundred page books in an hour. It's, I mean, and for so long I kept thinking, gosh, why am I so, I must be the slowest 
smartest person on the planet. I mean, how did they even let me into graduate school? And maybe it was a big accident or something, you know? But, I, I mean, it's still up for conjecture. <laughs> but, but anyway, I guess the takeaways I would want to leave you with are one that even with, with the premise or with the caveat that every single person has a different experience, I'll say these things hold true, at least in my, my experience. First, I think that when we think about reading in the professional sense, it's not just about having access to material, but developing processes for interacting that material. So it wouldn't take someone long to learn how to scan a book. You could do that in about half an hour to teach someone how to scan something. But learning how to take in information, if you think of for anyone that ever used old school DOS computers, is there anyone here? Yeah, sure. Is that yeah. that right? So it's a very one dimensional thing, right? But if you're looking at a Windows machine, you're able to see things simultaneously. You can have three windows up at one time. Um, if you're doing research as a sighted person, you can lay out all these books in front of you and pick it up and scan it and put it down. And technology allows more of that, even though it doesn't allow it in the same way. Um, but what that means is that you then need time to transition into that kind of access. So now I have all this access, but I still feel like a graduate student all over again. But a happy one, because I'm really excited to access. Great, thank you. Thank you. We'll, um, we'll, we'll say sure that. Q&A until the end, if you uh, allow these uh, stories, we'll, we'll be um, Our second speaker is Lee Mills, a freelance writer and journalist who writes about the arts, business, and topics related to blindness. She's written for The Guardian, The Financial Times, and The Daily Telegraph, and can often be heard on the BBC. Importantly for us, she's currently writing a book titled Life Unseen, The Story of Blindness. Um, this book covers the history of blindness in the Western world from a uniquely personal slant, describing her own diminishing sight. And she just shared the good news with me uh, a few minutes ago that <laughs> it's scheduled to come out uh, in May. So, the not too distant future. Um, Selena, let's you. Uh, well, actually, I totally agree with half the things you've said, so I can leave now. Um, um, I was thinking, actually, about my relationship to reading a lot, and not just because of this conference, just because I'm going, I'm losing my sight myself. Um, blind in one eye, and I have a diminishing eyesight in my left eye, which for various reasons can't be fixed. And so I'm in this transitional state whereby I'm, I can still read very quite well, actually. Um, but I also have, I get very, very tired, and I also get, um, I have a narrow frame of vision, so I can only see like a sort of pinhole. So. My, you know, I'm sitting there in the middle of writing a book, which basically is going to take five years from beginning to end when I've done it, um, which has huge amounts of research um, and it's all visual. But it also made so I sort of started thinking about that, but I also thought about the fact that reading and writing is integral to my identity. I sort of I grew up. Um, I, was, I just sort of wrote myself some notes. I've been an avid reader since childhood, and, very, and it's very much shaped my own aspirations and desires in life. And by the time I was 17, I, I wrote a very bad romance novel, which actually got published by Wills and Boone, and you, <laughs> and you cannot find it because it's under a different name, and I'm not telling you who wrote what the name is. Um, just look for the worst book. <laughs> You just look for the most trashy novel you can find, and it's we'll find out and put the link on our website. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's out of print, thank God. And she has placed it there. Yes, exactly. Anyway, um, and I think then I obviously went to university, and um, obviously I went to university, and obviously books were very important there. And I was very lucky to attend an American university where, um, at the time, and I think things have shifted massively now, but at the time there was much more help visually impaired people and blind people at, um, there was sort of a lot more funding for a start, but I had a note taker, I had someone who photocopied things for me, I had people pick me up from lectures and walk me to other lectures, so I was immensely lucky and had this incredibly good experience. Um, 
um, also took me to the library and helped me find books. And one of the things I love about libraries is serendipity. And as I lose my sight, I'm losing serendipity, which is very annoying. Um, but, but, and then I became a journalist, and so therefore, again, um, words became very important in that too. But I had an incredibly good editor who said, I don't care if you're going blind. Um, he said, as long as you don't, you know, there's no mistakes. There's no spelling mistakes. There is no excuse for bad spelling. I don't care what you are. <laughs> Just, you know, please don't say that the stock market was the wrong zero, because otherwise a lot of people will lose a lot of money. So, um, and I was on the finance desk, which, as you can imagine, would be um, kind of dangerous. Um, and I did actually once write a story where I got the stock share wrong, and uh, we had to put out a correction, and I, I don't think I was forgiven for quite a while. Um, because of my sight, and then I ended up at the BBC, and I found that very hard too, because it's radio is very, very quick, news news turns around very, very quickly, and you have to be able to sort of read something that's coming up on your screen on Reuters very, very quickly, and suddenly I found myself unable to do it. So I think my shift has been over to audio much more than Braille, although I am learning it, um, and I will come on to Braille in a second, because I have lots of wonderful things to say about Braille. Um, the first thing is, I don't think this has been like this big dramatic sort of um, trauma for me. It's been a very, very slow um, grain of sand sort of loss of sight. So I don't wake up every morning and go, oh my god. Um, and also my reading has still been possible. So I'm still very much connected to the reading world. I'm actually reading this from my notebook. Um, but I have to do it in limited doses. Um, I also... <laughs> Very sadly, was obsessed with this writer, uh, with Henry James, and, <laughs> well, <so am> <laughs> and um, he had so up until 1897, he wrote everything himself by hand, and then in 1897 he hired Theodora Bosanke, <laughs> who was his secretary. So he's in his 50s, and he stopped writing himself by hand because of he got arthritis, and so I wrote this really, really tedious master's degree essay, um, sort of thesis on <laughs> the shift of writing by um, sight to writing by dictation and what that does to how it changes. Um, and it always inspired me. It didn't, it didn't even seem to be connected to sight. It was just to do with the sound of words and speech. And I actually, um, if you can bear with me, I actually found the quote from his diary. Um, I don't know if some of you probably all know this, but um, okay, so now I have to squint away. Yeah, I've taken lots of pictures of the optical. Um, <laughs> um, so he said, um, sorry, I just have to enlarge this so I can see. Um, it all seems, he explained to her, the secretary, to be so much more effectively and unceasingly pulled out of me in speech than I, when I was actually writing. So the idea, I like that idea that, that words are pulled out of you rather than having to translated through a pen or a, or a typewriter. Um, and so that really inspired me, and therefore I wasn't so frightened as I increasingly lost my sight. I wasn't so frightened because I thought, well, if Henry James can do it, so can I. Um, <laughs> very, very sadly, I have to say. Um, I actually, <laughs> on a slightly dimensional note, I actually once pretended to be Henry James's niece and uh, to get into Westminster Abbey. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, said, like, I said I was Henry James from Albany, and I was really going to see him. Anyway, that's another story. Um, so the things that really mean something, so the, what has changed for me is the sound of words. Some words are more comforting, some, like even just the vowel sounds have changed, have, have had a much more different relationship to the sound of things. Um, and so I wrote down actually a list of all the things that I think about when I'm listening versus reading visually. Um, rhythm, tone. nuance, pausing. I think the thing I found really hard to give up from moving from audio, uh, written to audio was the fact that you, you can't just stop it. I mean, you can, you press the button, but you have to have that moment, there's a, there's a lapse, you have to sort of stop, and you have to stop this voice in your head and getting used to that voice, whereas when you're in your own head reading, um, and I'm getting this with Braille now, there's just an immediate relationship between you and the word. And I, I sort of feel that when I listen to books, I find it, um, there's a little gap. It's like a little mind the gap moment. Um, 
Then I thought, is there a preference? Hello? Oh, sorry, I thought someone was talking to me. Um, is there a preference? Um, it depends on the task at hand. Um, in research, it's much better, I find, just reading myself. Um, I feel like I get my own intellectual ideas and inspiration hearing my own voice in my own head. Um, but for relaxation, I love handing myself over to another voice and just sort of saying, take me to Cranford or wherever it is. Um, and I call that sinking into the armchair of someone's voice. Um, I think the thing I would say, and this is probably my closing note, is that the thing that has changed for me is notions of privacy. And reading is such a private thing between you and your own head, as, as you were saying earlier. Um, but it's each person has their own relationship to it. Um, and I think when you're being read to or listening to people on tape, you are getting their interpretation. And I know that's yeah. a big subject that everyone has a big yeah. debate about. And I was actually thinking, Matt, what, Matt you, what you were saying earlier in your talk of your of books on tape about the, when I piped up, you know, slightly cynically, yes, those fights are still going on. They still are going on. There's only 7% of books in the publishing, well, in Britain anyway, are published on um, either by, in an alternative format. So it's very, it's, uh, it's quite, the people are still making choices about what I get to read on books on tape and things like that. So I'm still, I'm a bit of a, a grumbler when it comes to that. Um, but I sort of, I really like the quote you just read from John Hall, because I think actually I'm very grateful to be, if, I, if one's grateful in these matters, but grateful to lose my sight now rather than 100 years ago yeah. or 200 years ago, where apparently um, my favourite lady pianist called um, Teresa von Paradis um, had knots and she learned how to read certain bits of the Bible by learning which bit of the knot she was on. It was sort of like a rosary but for alphabet. Um, and so I'm sort of glad I don't have to do that. <laughs> Thank you. I, when, when I was thinking about how to, how, to, how to present to you, I was thinking that it would be interesting to go through um, a series of highlights of my reading history because it's a kind of um, exploration of different reading modalities, of which the Opticon is one. So it didn't start with the Opticon, I will come to the Opticon, but I, didn't, I, I wasn't expecting to talk just about the Opticon, so I hope that's okay. I'm not sure quite what people are specifically interested in, so um, I'll kind of whiz through this a little bit and then I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be some questions. So, um, I I'm different from the other two speakers in that um, I lost all of my sight very young. So, I was I'm totally blind and I lost all my sight from the age of about 15 months old. So, I haven't, um, I haven't had this kind of journey through losing, losing my sight and having to adapt. Uh, but, I, I learned to read first in Braille. So, I learned at nursery school, I had a, a, a teacher who was an absolutely brilliant teacher who was, who, um, was quite determined that I was going to learn to read and I, I loved it as soon as, I, as soon as I started to find out that a particular shape meant a particular thing, I really, really took to it because I'd always want, I, I loved listening to stories but I wanted to read for myself. Um, and the first, I, I thought it would be kind of nice to give you an idea of what Braille's like if that's at all possible and the first example of that was when my mum was helping me by kind of giving, giving me braille words and saying, right, come on, read these words, read these words. And I was doing fine. Um, I, I don't know how much you'd like to know about braille, but it uses, um, as was mentioned earlier, a cell is made up of six dots in a rectangle, um, two by, three by two, so three down, two across. And the letters are made up of combinations of dots but it also uses signs, so there's a, there's a sign for ER, there's a sign for ING, there's a sign for AR, and so on and so on and so on. So I was reading through these words that my mum was testing me on, um, boy, pony, da 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 da, and I then came across this word, and I couldn't understand what it was. And I, I, it was C-A-N-A-R-Y. I was going, what is this? Cane, canary? Uh, and I, I actually couldn't figure out what it was. And eventually she said, but it's a canary, why can't you get this? Um, and the reason is that she'd forgotten to use the AR sign. 
And so the shape of the word wasn't the same. It was, it was, a, it was something completely different. And I've read, I've read, you know, I've just used the word, but because she'd written it in this different way, the shape was different, so that threw me completely. And that might give you just a, an idea um, of, of how, when you're reading Braille, it becomes, I, I guess, a little bit like when you're, when you're looking at a printed page, you see the shapes of words, you don't think of each, you don't stop to read each letter. So, um, Braille was absolutely vital for all of my childhood. We even had a thing called the Braille Reading Competition every year. Um, there was quite a, quite a swish event in, in Westminster Church House, of, and people from all over the country came. And I think this it kind of shows how, how Braille was in, um, sort of everybody realised that then how important it was. There was a national Braille Reading Competition, uh, which I won several times, because I'm quite a fast reader, I'm a reasonably good I'm going to read a little tiny bit just to, to show you later on. Um, we had at school, we had reading speed tests because everyone was so, it was so important for everyone to read Braille that we were tested on our, on our reading speed at the beginning of each term. So that's, that's Braille, um, and I'm going to come back to Braille at the end. Um, but, but then, I suppose, when I was about 12 or 13, I started to, to discover talking books, and the first machine that I used... If, um, if some of you were, were here earlier and some of you may be looking at, around the ex exhibition, um, the first machine I used was like, if you can imagine, a giant cassette. <laughs> yeah. so a bit the size of a videotape, a bit like that. Um, and to be able to, 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 be able to listen to, to books which were not available, because um, Selina was just saying how now maybe 4 or 5% of books are produ produced in alternative formats. Back then, it was very much fewer than that. It was probably, I don't know, 0.5%, something like that. So it wasn't just, Braille was wonderful, but there were, there were not very many books in Braille. You couldn't, you couldn't get the Harry Potter books or whatever it might be in Braille. You just couldn't. So Talking Books was a new, a new wonderful discovery to be able to listen to that. And it was also um, sinking into the arms of the voice, as, as soon as you put it. It was, was something, something else. So it became something very... Um, it, was a, it was an added leisure activity. So that's talking books. And then, then came the Opticon. So this was back in the 70s. And the reason that I was so excited about the Opticon was this very same thing, that there were no books, or, or very, very few of the books that we wanted to read. So the idea that I could actually um, maybe borrow a book from the library that somebody had told me about, that I really should be reading, and actually read it myself, that was revolutionary really revolutionary, and it's the first example of reading technology that I came across. So, to talk a little bit about what, how the Opticon works, you have a camera in one hand, and your, so that would be your right hand, and that's a bit of a problem in itself, because I only read Braille with my right hand, so I'm used to, I'm used to reading with my right hand, my right hand is much more kind of sensitive, and it's just easier that way. So, um, the... The reason for that is that it's quite difficult. Scanning the camera across a page of print is quite difficult to hold it straight, to keep along the line. If, if you, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's very easy to imagine, but it's the, the size of print, when I discovered how small print is actually is, and realised that you can actually, you guys can just look at it and, and read such tiny letters, really surprised me. Um, and the camera having to keep, keep on the line is, is really tricky. So when you first learn the Opticon, your left hand, you have your index finger placed on this um, array of metal vibrating pins. It sounds like some kind of torture device. <laughs> Actually, it's not very comfortable at all. And if you, if you do it for any length of time, your finger starts to tingle and it's quite painful. But that kind of gives you some idea of how much we wanted to do it because it's, it, we were quite willing to put up with that. And what happens is, you're moving the camera from left to right along the page, and the shape of the letters comes up under your left index finger. So, as you, let's say, say you take a letter L, you, you hit the vertical line, a capital L, you hit the vertical line first, and then you move the camera and you, sub, you get the, 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 the horizontal line moving underneath your finger. So, if you can imagine the letters coming at you, or kind of... Your, your finger moving from left to right. You never see um, 
more than one part of a letter, not even a whole letter at a time. You don't see a whole letter A, you just feel it moving underneath your finger. And it was possible to get to a speed something like this, reading that way. So it was not something you would do uh, to enjoy a Henry James novel. <laughs> okay. um, but what it did mean was that I could look up words in a dictionary because the Braille um, version of the Little Oxford Dictionary is in 16 huge great volumes. So if you imagine a book about the size of the Bible and then 16 of those would be the Oxford Dictionary. So that's not terribly practical. The, the pocket French dictionary was 19 volumes. It's that kind of thing. And so to be able to use a dictionary, to be able to find something in a book to be able to find uh, later on. I realise that I'm going to have to speed up a little bit because otherwise I'll be going on for too long. So please stop me if I, if I need to be stopped. Okay. Um, the, the ability to just directly read is what I'm getting at. The next bit of technology was called a VersaBrain. And what this did was it used um, the early kind of computer program, if, if any of you remember the BBC Micro that used to use cassettes to record computer programs, it used a cassette to record digital braille, and it had a braille display, which is, if you, for those of you who can see, this machine has a braille display on it. And that, was, that was allowing us to store books digitally, and then read directly on a braille display. Now, and the braille display uses pins to form those cells that we were talking about earlier on. Um, the next amazing machine that came along was called the Kurzweil Reading Machine, and what that did was unbelievable. It, 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 it really blew me away. It meant that you could, you could get a print book, open it any way you wanted from the beginning, even if you, if you felt inclined, stick it on the machine, and within 30 seconds it would start reading it to you. This was, again, it was another revolution, and I can still remember the first time um, these, these things, I said how wonderful they are, but the trouble is they cost £23,000. And the first, the first one I saw was in a library in San Francisco, and, and I just stuck a book on there, and it started reading James Thurber to me. And I was just, this is unbelievable. Again, why is it so amazing? Simply because we couldn't get hold of those books any other way. So I studied, um, when I was at university, like, um, sorry, Sajel? Sajel. Sajel. Like Sajel, I was using readers at college to read books onto cassette, recording the, 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 the bits of reading, because these were, these were psychology journals and all sorts of stuff that, that I didn't have access to this, this wonderful reading machine then. So this was yet another modality. I, I had to use cassettes, had to find, had to wind through to find the uh, 43 minutes through the, first, through the third side of this cassette to find the actual article that I needed. It was dr just dreadful. The next different modality that I came across was when computers started to become usable with speech. Um, and this was, I was living in France, and they, they had a system called Minitel, which was a little bit like a very, very early version of the web, in that people, everyone in France had this terminal in their house. And I discovered that with a computer, with speech, a talking computer, I was able to actually find um, read, read bits out of journal, bits out of magazines, bits out of newspapers, um, look up what was on at the cinema, the sort of thing that you would be able to find in a magazine, all that kind of thing was, again, revolutionary. Um, then we started to be able to get books on floppy disk, which I had to listen to with a synthetic voice that was reading a bit like that, but it was, it was, it was actually a way of getting access to yet more different titles, newspapers, magazines, then came bulletin boards and the internet. And alongside that, the sort of technology that was used by this reading machine, the Kurzweil reading machine, um, which is called Optical Character Recognition, OCR, that meant that that became cheap enough that everyone could have it. So we could use a scanner with a computer and um, either listen to it by speech or read it on a, on a braille display. So all of this technology is converging and what can you do now, having, having 
whizzed through the different sort of modalities and the different ways of getting, because I guess there's two, there's, there's Braille, there's speech, there's the Opticon, and then there's the fact of actually being able to access all of this material. And I'm now happy to be able to say that I'm overloaded. I'm absolutely <laughs> swimming in information, as opposed to, to feeling as if I was totally starved of information when for, for the first, possibly the first half of my life, I guess. I was really, really desperately starved and I couldn't find, I just could not access what I needed. Now, I'm absolutely overloaded. I, I don't know where to look. I, 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 I'm still trying to get to grips with Facebook and so on and so on and so on. But, this brain, and this is where, this is my conclusion, so I'm going to stop, you'll be happy to, to hear. Um, with this machine, I can read to my children in the evening. Like, so I've got books on here. I just wanted to read you a little bit of what I'm reading to my little girl at the moment, just to give you an idea of what, it's, of what you can do with Braille, really. So I'm going to find the book. Um, and what else can I do when I'm finding it? I can connect it to an iPhone. I can browse the web. Um, I can, as I say, if, if I could understand Facebook, I could use Facebook too. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, you, can, you can just do everything that, that, that everyone else can do with information technology. Um, and it's, it's more exciting for us because it wasn't possible before. That's, that's I guess, my point. So I'm just, this, this, is, this is a bit of braille reading. Heidi stood with her hands behind her back, carefully noting all they did. Peter, she said to the boy, who had again thrown himself down on the ground. The prettiest of all the goats are little swan and little bear. Yeah, I know they are, was the answer. Our uncle brushes them down, washes them, and gives them salt, and he so so on and so on and so on. So yeah, I can just that means through Braille, I can read for myself, I can read to my children, and the, if if there's one takeaway from this, um, it is that Braille is not dead. Braille is it, it, so many people think that Braille is an old technology that it's not it, not technology even, but it's not dead. It's absolutely essential for literacy because. Having compared it with those other modalities, with the Opticon that was wonderful but extremely slow, um, with audio which is wonderful for leisure but not so great if you're trying to study something, um, with all the other things, Braille is just vital and it's, it's usable through a machine like this. You don't have to have things printed out on, uh, in 19 volumes. I've got on this machine, I've got the Bible, I've got dictionaries. It's, it's just, it's still alive and kicking. And that's really what I wanted.